Chapter Nine of Farewell Nicola by Guy Boothby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. With a heart as heavy as lead, I made my way downstairs, and having chartered a gondola, bade the man take me to the Palace Revici with all possible haste. Old Galaghetti, who stood upon the steps, nodded vehement approval, and rubbed his hands with delight as he thought of the triumph his great doctor must inevitably achieve. As I left the hotel, I looked back at it with a feeling of genuine sorrow. Only a few days before, our party had all been so happy together, and now one was stricken down with a mysterious malady that, so far as I could see, was likely to end in her death. Whether the gondolier had been admonished by Galagatti to make haste and was anxious to do so in sympathy with my trouble, I cannot say. The fact, however, remains that we accomplished the distance that separated the hotel from the palace in what could have been little more than half the time usually taken. My star was still in the ascendant when we reached the palace, for when I had disembarked at the steps, the old man who did menial service for Nicola had just opened it and looked out. I inquired whether his master was at home, and if so, whether I could see him. He evidently realised that my Italian was one of the most rudimentary description for it was necessary for me to repeat my question three or four times before he could comprehend my meaning. When at last he did so, he pointed up the stairs to signify that Nicola was at home, and also that if I desired to see him, I had better go in search of him. I immediately did so, and hastened up the stairs to the room I have already described, and of which I entertained such ghastly recollections. I knocked upon the door, and a well-known voice bade me in English to come in. I was in too great a haste to fulfil my mission to observe at the time the significance of these words contained. It was not until afterwards that I remembered the fact that as we approached the palace I had looked up at Nicola's window and had seen no sign of him there, and as I had not rung the bell but had been admitted by the old man's servant, how could he have become aware of my presence? But as I say, I thought of all that afterwards, for the moment the only desire I had was to inform Nicola of my errand. Upon entering the room, I found Nicola standing before a table, on which were glasses, test tubes, and various chemical paraphernalia. He was engaged in pouring some dark-coloured fluid into a graduating glass, and when he spoke, it was without looking round at me. I am very glad to see you, my dear Hatteras, he said. It is kind of you to take pity on my loneliness, if you don't mind sitting down for a few moments and lighting a cigar. You'll find a box on the table. I shall have finished this, and then we can talk. But I'm afraid I can't wait, I answered. I've come on the most important business. There's not a moment to lose. In that case, I'm supposed that Miss Trevor is worse, he said, putting down the bottle from which he'd been pouring, and afterwards replacing the glass stopper with the same hand. I was afraid it might be so. How do you know that she is ill, I asked, not a little surprised to hear that he was aware of our trouble. I managed to know a good many things, he replied. I was aware that she was ill and had been wondering how long it would be before I was called in. The other doctors don't like my interference, I suppose. They certainly do not, I answered. They have done no good for her. And you think I may be able to help you, he inquired, looking at me over the graduating glass with his strange, dark eyes. I certainly do, I replied. I am your debtor for the compliment. And you will come? You really wish it? I believe it's the only thing that will save her life, I answered. But you must come quickly or it'll be too late. She was sinking when I left the hotel. With a hand that never shook, he poured the contents of the glass into a small phial and then placed the latter in his pocket. I am at your disposal now, he answered. We will set off as soon as you like. As you say, we must lose no time. But will it not be necessary for you to take some drugs with you, I asked. I am taking this one, he replied, placing his hat upon his head as he spoke. I remembered that he had been making his prescription up as I entered the room. Had he then intended calling to see her, even supposing I had not come to ask his assistance? I had no chance of putting the question to him, however. Have you a gondola below? he asked, as we went down the stairs. I replied in the affirmative, and when we gained the hall door, we descended the steps and took our places in it. On reaching the hotel, I conducted him to the drawing-room, where we found the Dean and Glen Bath eagerly awaiting our coming. I presented the former to Nicola, and I went off to inform my wife of his arrival. 
she accompanied me back to the drawing-room and when she entered the room nikola crossed it to receive her though she looked at him in a frightened way i thought his manner soon put her at her ease perhaps you will be kind enough to take me to my patient he said when they had greeted each other as the case is so serious i had better lose no time in seeing her he followed my wife from the room and then we sat down to await his verdict with what anxiety you may imagine of all that transpired during his stay with miss trevor i can only speak from hearsay my wife however was unfortunately too agitated to remember everything that occurred she informed me that on entering the room he advanced very quietly towards the bed and for a few moments stood looking down at the frail burden it supported then he felt her pulse lifted the lids of her eyes and for a space during which a man might have counted fifty slowly he laid his hand upon her forehead then turning to the nurse who had of course heard of the withdrawal of the other doctors he bade her bring him a wine glass of iced water she disappeared and while she was absent nicholas sat by the bedside holding the sick girl's hand and never for a moment taking his eyes from her face presently the woman returned bringing the water as directed he took it from her and going to the window poured from a phial which he had taken from his pocket some twenty drops of the dark liquid it contained then with a spoon he gave her nearly half of the contents of the glass this done he once more seated himself beside the bed and waited patiently for the result several times within the next half hour he bent over the recumbent figure and was evidently surprised at not seeing some change which he expected would take place at the end of that time he gave her another spoonful of the liquid and once more sat down to watch when an hour had passed he permitted a sigh of satisfaction to escape him in turning to my wife whose anxiety was plainly expressed upon her face he said i think lady hatteras that you may tell them that she will not die there is still much to be done but i pledge my word that she will live the reaction was too much for my wife she felt as if she were choking then she turned giddy and was at last possessed with a frantic desire to cry softly leaving the room she came in search of us the moment that she opened the door of the drawing-room and i looked upon her face i knew that there was good news for us what does he say about her cried the duke forgetting the dean's present while the latter rose and drew a step nearer without speaking a word there is good news she said fumbling with her handkerchief in a suspicious manner dr nicola says she will live thank god we all said in one breath and glenbarth murmured something more that i did not catch so implicit was our belief in nicola that as you have doubtless observed we accepted his verdict without a second thought i kissed my wife and then shook hands solemnly with the dean the duke had meanwhile vanished presumably to his own apartment where he could meditate on certain matters undisturbed after that phyllis left us and returned to the sick-room where she found nicola still seated beside the bed just as she had left him so far as she could judge miss trevor did not appear to be any different though perhaps she did not breathe as heavily as she had hitherto done nicola however appeared to be well satisfied he nodded approvingly to phyllis as she entered and then returned to his contemplation of his patient once more in this fashion hour after hour went by once during each my wife would come to me with reassuring bulletins miss trevor was if anything a little better she did not seem so restless as before the fever seems to be abating and then towards nine o'clock that night at last gertrude was sleeping peacefully it was not however until nearly midnight that nicola himself made his appearance the worst is over he said approaching the dean your daughter is now asleep and will only require watching for the next two hours at the end of that time i shall return and shall hope to find a decided improvement in her condition i can never thank you enough my dear sir said the worthy old clergyman shaking the other by the hand while the tears ran down his wrinkled cheeks but for your wonderful skill there can be no sort of doubt that she will be lost to us now she is my only child my ewe lamb and may heaven bless you for your goodness to me i thought nicola looked at him rather curiously as he said this it was the first time i had seen nicola brought into the society of a dignitary of the english church and i was anxious to see how the pair comported themselves under the circumstances a couple more diametrically opposed could be scarcely imagined 
they were as oil and water and could scarcely be expected to assimilate sir i should have been less than human if i had not done everything possible to save that beautiful young life said nikola with what was to me the suggestion of a double meaning in his speech and now you must permit me to bid you good-bye for the present in two hours i shall return again thinking he might prefer to remain near his patient i pressed him to stay at the hotel offering to do all that lay in my power to make him comfortable but he would not hear of such a thing as you should be aware by this time i never rest away from my own house he answered in a tone that settled the matter once and for all if anything should occur in the meantime send for me and i will come at once i do not apprehend any change however when he had gone i went in search of the duke and found him in his own room dick he said look at me and tell me if you can see any difference i feel as though i had passed through years of suffering another week would have made an old man of me how is she now progressing famously i answered you need not look so sceptical for this must surely be the case since nikola has gone home to take some rest and will not return for two hours he wrung my hand on hearing this how little i dreamt he said when we were confined in that wretched room in port said and when he played that trick upon me in sydney that some day he was destined to do me the greatest service any man has ever done me in my life didn't i tell you that those other medicos did not know what they were doing and that nikola is the greatest doctor in the world i admitted that he had given me the first assurance but i was not so certain about the latter then realising how he must be feeling i proposed that we should row down the canal for a breath of fresh sea air at first the duke was for refusing the invitation eventually however he assented and when we had induced the dean to accompany us we set off when we reached the hotel once more it was to discover that nikola had returned and that he had again taken up his watch in the sick room he remained there all night passing hour after hour at the bedside without so my wife asserted moving save to give the medicine and without apparently feeling the least fatigue it was not until between seven and eight o'clock the next morning that i caught a glimpse of him he was in the dining room then partaking of a small cup of black coffee into which he had poured some curious decoction of his own for my part i have never yet been able to discover how nikola managed to keep body and soul together on his frugal fare how is the patient this morning i asked when we had greeted each other out of danger he replied slowly stirring his coffee as he spoke she will continue to progress now i hope you are satisfied that i have done all i can in her interests i am more than satisfied i answered i am deeply grateful as her father said yesterday if it had not been for you nikola she must inevitably have succumbed she will have cause to bless your name for the remainder of her existence he looked at me very curiously as i said this do you think she will do that he asked with unusual emphasis do you think it will please her to remember that she owes her life to me i am sure she will always be deeply grateful i replied somewhat ambiguously i fancy you know that yourself and your wife what does she say she thinks you are certainly the greatest of all doctors i answered with a laugh i feel that i ought to be jealous but strangely enough i am not and yet i have done nothing so very wonderful he continued almost as if he were talking to himself but that those other blind worms are content to go on digging in their mud and they should be seeking the light in another direction they could do as much as i have done by the way have you seen our friend don martinos since you dined together at my house i replied to the effect that i had not done so but reported that the don had sent repeated messages of sympathy to us during miss trevor's illness i then inquired whether nikola had seen him i saw him yesterday morning he replied we devoted upwards of four hours to exploring the city together i could not help wondering how the don had enjoyed the excursion but needless to remark i did not say anything on this score to my companion that night nikola was again in attendance upon his patient next day she was decidedly better she recognized her father and my wife and every hour was becoming more and more like her former self was she surprised when she gained consciousness to find nikola at her bedside i inquired of phyllis when the great news was reported to me strangely enough she was not phyllis replied i fully expected remembering my previous suspicions they would have a bad effect upon her but it did nothing of the kind it was just as if she had expected to find him there and what were his first words to her 
i hope you are feeling better miss trevor he said she replied much better that was all it was as commonplace as could be next day nikola only looked in twice the day after once and at the end of the week informed me that she stood in no further need of his attention how shall we ever be able to reward you nikola i asked for about the hundredth time as we stood together in the corridor outside the sick room i have no desire to be rewarded he answered it is enough for me to see miss trevor restored to health endeavour if you can to recall a certain conversation we had together respecting the lady in question on the evening that i narrated to you the story concerning the boy who was so badly treated by the spanish governor did i not tell you then that our destinies were inextricably woven together i informed you that it had been revealed to me many years ago that we should meet should you feel surprised therefore if i told you that i had also been warned of this illness once more i found myself staring at him in amazement you are surprised believe me however astonishing it may seem it is quite true i knew that miss trevor would come into my life i knew also that it would be my lot to save her from death what is more i know that in the end one thing which has seemed to me most desirable in life will be taken from me by her hands i'm afraid i cannot follow you i said perhaps not but you will be able to some day he answered that moment has not yet arrived in the meantime watch and wait for before we know it it will be upon us then with a look that was destined to haunt me for many a long day he bade me farewell and left the hotel end of chapter nine